Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My daughter demands I raise her babies, but I want to retire in peace. After that, when my parents were thrown out of a kid's birthday party because they asked the stupidest thing imaginable. And after that, would I be the jerk if I didn't go to my brother's wedding over a bridesmaid's dress? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen has to raise her own babies. How can I raise them when you won't give me any Reddit boy? Ow. Don't ever do that again. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My daughter demands I raise her babies, but I want to retire in peace. I, 58 female, and my husband, Rob, who's 61, have two kids, Erica, who's 35, and Mike, who's 30. Both kids are married, but Erica and her husband, Steve, who's 38, live nearby us, and this issue concerns them. They work full-time and they have two kids, who are five and four years old. Five years ago, my daughter asked my husband and me if we would be willing to become their full-time childcare so she could continue to work and afford their comfortable life. We agreed, but we didn't discuss much more than watching the baby and their expectations. I was a teacher and retired two years before I could take my pension, so my husband continued to work, and we made a few sacrifices like vacations and adding to our savings, but we were able to make it work so I could take my full pension at 55 and my husband retired a year later. Our arrangement worked and we enjoyed having the kids, except by year 3, 2020, we started to feel like they were taking advantage of our help. In 2020, during the lockdown, they both were working from home. They expected us to keep the kids all day, and we wanted to split time with them since their preschool and daycare was closed. We settled on two with them and three with us, and my son-in-law complained about it pretty much every day. Things got better when the kids were able to go back to school. Fast forward to year four, 2021. We have a bit of a blow up over kindergarten. My daughter did not want her five-year-old son to start school in the unknown, but I insisted that he needed to go because I needed the break. I also asked for her four-year-old to spend more time at the preschool and daycare program. Son-in-law complained about the cost, but I pushed anyway. They relented, and then this past spring, son-in-law pushed for us to take the kids for a week so they could go on a vacation. We said they had to take the kids, and he said, We can't afford it. No one went on vacation. Maybe that's too much background, but I feel like the context is important for what I said. My daughter and I were casually having a conversation the other day, and she mentions that she had a doctor's appointment and tests. I asked if everything was okay, and she said Steve and her were trying for baby number three. I asked her what her childcare plan was, and she looked at me like I was crazy and said us. I said that it would have been nice if she had told me this before trying for another baby. She said it's none of my business. I said it is if I'm providing five more years of babysitting. I then told her that we were not a viable childcare option for a new baby and begged her to reconsider. Her four-year-old is going off to kindergarten. We feel like we're getting our days back to some extent and refuse to start all over again with an infant. Erica said we are making her choose between her dream of having three kids and financial stability. I argued that she has two beautiful kids already and they are financially stable. They shouldn't ruin that with another baby. I might be the jerk because Erica feels like we should have told her sooner. I feel like I'm not because I never agreed to a lifetime of raising their kids. Edit. We will continue to watch our two grandkids after school and during the summer as this is what we have agreed to and we enjoy it. School provides a nice break for us and then we do fun things with the kids in the summer. We just don't want to start over again with another baby. Edit 2. Just to add a bit more context and I want to answer some of the comments I'm seeing a lot. We are not paid and we didn't ask to be. I retired early but would have stayed longer if we didn't watch our grandkids. I probably would have put in another 5 years or so because I loved my job. So putting those 5 years into helping my daughter and grandkids wasn't a problem. My husband and I did a good job of preparing for retirement and felt that we could swing it. We do take time for ourselves. We require 5 weeks a year at a minimum to travel, visit our son or other family. We settled on 5 because our daughter gets 3 weeks of vacation a year and son-in-law gets 2. At first, son-in-law complained that him and my daughter would never get a vacation together. We said that they would just simply have to arrange other care options if they want time together so we could still have our 5 weeks. We do hold them to this, and one time in the past five years, his parents came down to stay with them and watch the kids during that week we were away. In terms of telling her to not have another baby, 
I was trying to make her see everything she does have and to focus less on what she doesn't have. Lastly, my daughter and son-in-law have plenty of money and are responsible when it comes to costs. If anything, my son-in-law is cheap, so I think their version of stability and many others would be very different. Not the jerk. Red flags should have been raised when they wanted to go on holiday without their kids at this age. Parenting is not something you take a break from, especially at four or five years old. They sound very unprepared to be parents at all, let alone for three kids. Edit. For clarity, by taking a break, I meant taking prolonged vacations. Of course it's fine to occasionally drop your kids off at your parents for a gathering or one night of enjoying life. Plenty of people take a break from their kids by leaving them with grandparents for a weekend, but the grandparents have to agree to it first. They wanted to leave their kids for a week? When the grandparents already have the kids every day full time? Why would the parents expect a break, but not want the grandparents to have one? Yes, parents are allowed to want a vacation away from their kids. Seven to 10 days is minuscule compared to the 365 days a year. Sure, if this was every month, then that would be neglectful. But a one week trip every couple of years without kids isn't going to ruin anyone's life, nor does it show that parents don't care about their kids. The key is ensuring you have safe, reliable, and comfortable care from individuals who happily agree to watch your kids for the entire time away. As a general note, parents don't stop being individuals when they become parents. It's a toxic and unsustainable mindset that parents should never be allowed to want or plan things without their kids. As long as their kids are well cared for, loved, and there is adequate care for the times parents aren't around, then this is a non-issue. OP is not the jerk for telling your daughter you won't watch another kid. Choosing to have a kid means thinking about childcare. A parent who dumps their kid off on someone else at literally every opportunity isn't a parent. And a week vacation from the kids wouldn't be an issue if they were the ones taking care of them full time. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her daughter and son-in-law? Please let us know. Don't you just love it when parents think it's your duty to watch their kids for them for free? When my parents were thrown out of a kid's birthday party because they asked the stupidest thing imaginable. This happened, I think, when my brother was around six to seven years old. A neighbor boy down the street was having his birthday party, and my brother got invited because they were sort of friends, but probably because they knew my parents would bring a gift. And they did. Don't remember what it was, though, nor do I really care. My parents dragged me along to this party, even though I would have rather stayed home and played video games. I was bored and sitting down almost the entire time, so I got to witness pretty much the whole situation. It started when my brother was caught picking up the gifts off the table and shaking them. The mother of the birthday boy told him to stop and my parents tried to defend my brother and say he was harmless. But the lady knew what my brother was really like and had my parents move him away from the presents. There were some games that the kids were playing. Don't remember what they were, but I do remember my brother tried to be the center of attention as much as possible. With each game, the birthday boy got first pick and first turn on all of them because it was his birthday but my brother freaked out because he didn't get to go first. And my parents did ask the birthday boy's mother if my brother could get the first pick in turns. And the lady not only refused, but told my parents to get my brother under control or we'd all be asked to leave. Then came time for the cake. The mother lit the candles for the birthday boy and the adults started singing the happy birthday song. They only got as far as singing the birthday boy's name in the song before my brother burst into a tantrum on the table. He grabbed the side of the table and started trying to shake it. My parents had to hold my brother back for a moment, and then I saw my mother go up and talk to the mother of the birthday boy again about something, and the poor lady looked positively disgusted, and I learned later that she had asked her to let my brother blow out the candles first, and then they could redo it. The lady told my mother that it would be best if we left, and then they went back to trying to redo the birthday song. Well, my brother couldn't take it and ran to the table and shoved the whole cake right at the birthday boy. I mean, he used his arm to literally clothesline the cake and heave it right at the birthday boy. The whole room was silent for a few seconds and then a bunch of the kids started laughing. Then the birthday boy started crying and all the adults were mortified, except for my parents. My mother just started hugging my brother tightly and acting like a Karen by saying this all could have been prevented if they had just let my brother blow out the candles first. The mother of the birthday boy was cleaning up chocolate cake off her son and screamed at my parents to get out. The other kids there started crying because it had finally hit them now that there was no cake. My mother started dragging my brother out, but he broke free of her and then pushed over the table with all the presents on it. I grabbed him and held him still until my parents got him. 
I apologized profusely to the mother of the birthday boy and said I wasn't on my parents' side in this matter. Yeah, that's right. Little 12-year-old me had to apologize for my own parents. My dad yelled at me to get moving or I could walk home. I said I'd walk. It was literally a quarter mile down the street. I stayed and helped clean up the mess my brother made. The lady thanked me and said that I was a good egg, but my brother was just rotten. Someone went out and got another cake while the birthday boy had to take a shower because it was covered in cake. All of the mess was cleaned up and they redid the birthday song. After the party was over, the mother of the birthday boy wrote something on a piece of paper. It was a handwritten invoice to my parents for the destroyed cake along with a written threat to call police as someone there with a camera caught everything. I handed the invoice to my parents and they really didn't look happy when they read it. Then they gave me the cash and told me to take it back to the lady. So I did. And that was pretty much it. Neither that kid or his family ever associated with my brother or my parents ever again. But the messed up thing is that at another birthday party months later, the same situation nearly repeated entirely. My mother asked the parents to let my brother blow out the candles first, gave stupid excuses as to why, and they outright refused, and my mother acted like a total Karen. My brother tried to knock down the cake, I was on guard and intercepted him, then we were told to leave. It was after that my brother was no longer invited to birthday parties that were not relatives. And then on my next birthday in that same year when I turned 13, my parents tried to get me to let my brother blow out my candles, and my aunt tore into them for that. It was then, I guess, that my parents decided that if I couldn't share, the next year I shouldn't even have a party at all. Would I be the jerk if I didn't go to my brother's wedding over a bridesmaid dress? I'm currently in medical school and I live across the country from my brother and family. I was surprised when his fiancée asked me to be a bridesmaid because I barely know her, but she wants to have all the siblings in the wedding. I made it clear that their wedding was during my final exam week and while I was able to get an accommodation to take my last two exams early, I still wouldn't be able to help much with planning or be present at things like a bachelorette party or a bridal shower. She said that was fine. It would mostly just be to have an even number of bridesmaids to groomsmen and for the pictures. There's a group chat that was created months ago that I would read through every couple of days to get updates on things I needed to do, namely to order a bridesmaid dress. Links were sent with three styles to choose from and we would be updated on colors later. So a couple weeks go by and I ask what color to order. Bride says she's still thinking about it. A couple more weeks go by and she's still thinking. Then a couple more weeks. You get the idea. Now it's at the point that if I don't order this dress in a couple of days, it won't be here in time. So I ask on Saturday what color. No response in the group chat to me. I asked again yesterday, Sunday, what color do I need to order? Then I'm flooded with messages lambasting me for not ordering a dress yet, from her sisters and my sister and her. My sister called me, told me to get my crap together and order a dress already, because my lack of being prepared is causing the bride intense anxiety because she doesn't think my dress will be here on time for the wedding now. She texted me this morning, Don't forget to order your dress. Love you. With smiling and kissing emojis. Still, no one has told me what color. I've scoured the group chat for a mention of dress colors or an image of a dress, but only the maid of honor sent a photo of her dress and I don't even know if she has a special color. There's thousands of messages, so it's not simple to find anything. Everyone else can meet in person, so I assume the decision on color was relayed in person. I can't tell if I'm being purposefully excluded. About an hour ago, my brother called me, pleading with me to work things out with the bride because she's panicking about me. I tried to explain this to him and he told me he doesn't care. It's a petty issue and since I'm not there for anything else, this is the least I can do because the bride thinks I don't like her because I wouldn't come to anything. He's taking her side. They know I'm in medical school. I have literally no say in my schedule and I'm on the other side of the country 5.5 hours by plane. I'm fed up with them and contemplating telling my instructors the wedding was moved and I will take my exams at the regular time. I'd have more time to study that way anyway. I haven't told anyone in my family I'm considering doing this. Would I be the jerk? Update. I called my mother and asked her what color the bridesmaid dresses were. She said lavender. The only color option on the website that I would call lavender are named pearly lilac, periwinkle, and orchid purple. I texted the maid of honor, the bride's sister, to ask what dress color and got a multi-paragraph long lecture about not having ordered my dress yet. Basically, they're trying so hard to accommodate me being across the country by including me in the group chat. 
She said she didn't remember the shade name, but it's a dusty purple, then sent a blurry picture of a wrinkled order confirmation. The shade name was Mulberry. On the dress website, that is a darker wine kind of purple color. I told her this and she said to order the lighter dusty purple color. I sent her a screenshot with a list of shade names and asked, which of these? She said she didn't know because everyone ordered their dress so long ago and asked for pictures of the dresses in different shades from the website. So I sent screenshots of all the light purple colors. No response for a while, so I called her on the phone, which she was upset about because it's past 10 p.m. over there now. Her response was, Look, I don't care what your problem is with me and my sister, but if you want to stay in good standing with this family, you need to get your ducks lined up, girly. I ignored the lecture comments and I asked, What color? Her response, Light purple. Me, of the three I sent, which one is it? I don't remember. I'll have to ask one of the other bridesmaids for her receipt. I'll get back to you. Ugh. I called my second brother, the one not getting married. He said they're pulling similar things with him, and he feels like he was deliberately given the wrong dates for the bachelor party by the best man, the bride's brother, so that he would miss it. He inadvertently learned about the changed date the morning of, and when he asked the best man, he told him it must have slipped his mind to tell him then joked that he wouldn't have missed much since he probably won't enjoy any of the festivities anyway. I don't understand why they can't just tell you what color to order. Not the jerk, this is weird. It could be the bride's passive-aggressive way of getting unknown sister out of the bridal party and still look like the good guy. ETA. Yup, her edit makes it clear. I would send one last message, short and sweet. I have not been told what color dress to order. If I don't hear back by tonight, the dress won't arrive and I will have to withdraw. Hope to hear from you. Don't let the VP know we are over budget. Several years ago, I worked in the purchasing department of a large semiconductor company in the US. Mostly I handled all the non-production purchases and contracts like office equipment, building management, travel contracts, that sort of stuff. But my biggest role was negotiating and approving temp staffing contracts for our US factories. One day a director, we'll call him Bill, sends me a request for $150,000 for temp workers at a small facility in the middle of nowhere in Florida. The news was that a couple of local businesses had closed and he had this great idea to save the company money by moving some production down there and snatching up those now desperate workers on the cheap. It seemed like a bit of a dumb idea at the time, but it was clearly his pet project and $150,000 was within his right to spend without additional approval. So I rubber stamped it and off he went. I hadn't had much interaction with Bill, but he was a pompous jerk, so I was glad to get rid of him. Now, it's important to this story to understand that our company's finance were super tightly controlled. Not a bad thing, but if you wanted to spend a dollar over your role's limit, you better have your supervisor's signature in triplicate. Directors like Bill could spend up to $250,000, VPs $500,000, and anything over $500,000 had to go all the way up to our CEO for approval. About three months later, the trouble starts when Bill suddenly turns back up asking for more money. Turns out, rural Florida doesn't have a lot of people with the skills to work in an industrial clean room, and the people who do don't come cheap. The money that was supposed to last a year is already gone, but Bill is certain that he just needs a little more time and asks me to approve another $250,000 without telling our VP, his boss. I straight up refuse since it's my literal job to stop this, but Bill, being God's gift to the company, throws an absolute fit. It got ugly, and long story short, my boss directly ordered me to approve Bill's money without escalating it. I got this all in writing since it was sketchy and absolutely something I could get fired for. Finally, Bill's gone and I don't have to see his smug, short, balding head anymore. Or so I thought. Having disrespected the great and powerful Bill, I was now the target of his displeasure. For the next four months, I get at least three emails or phone calls a day from him or his secretary about something they don't like about the building, the landscaping, the guy who brings the bottled water, the snack selection in the machine, the equipment in the sea level gym, on and on. I'm getting openly berated for these things that have nothing to do with me, but I'm stuck having to deal with them because my boss keeps caving to Bill's whims, and none of my paperwork is getting past his office either. I manage the purchasing for 12 facilities in the US and Europe, but if it needs his signature, I've got to personally bring it to him and stand there while he reviews it or he's refusing to sign. It was somewhere between humiliating and infuriating and I increasingly wished he'd fall down a staircase. 
After months of this, finally, my chance for malicious compliance arrived. Shockingly, Bill hasn't managed to turn his pet project around, and what do you know, he needs a quarter million to get him through the year. I sign off, add the money to the purchase order, which now totals a cool $650,000, and shoot off an email to both him and my boss to remind them that this won't be shown to the VP. Then I print everything out, including the direct order not to show it to the VP, and march over to the CEO's office for him to sign. After all, it was now over the $500,000 required limit, and Bill never asked for him not to see it. All heck broke loose when they realized Bill's little project was half a million dollars over budget. He didn't lose his job, but he refused to speak to me after that, which was exactly what I wanted. The Florida project was scrapped and was retasked to making basic electrical components. My boss was initially upset, but once he realized my insistence on getting Bill's order in writing had probably saved both of us, the whole thing went away. I was there for another year, and thankfully Bill never made an appearance at my office ever again. Am I the jerk for not letting my parents move in with me because I don't want to give up my pet's room? I, 37 female, am not close with my parents, who are 65 and 67. One of several reasons is their control, and I always hated that. Even living alone, they wanted to control, and it took several years of therapy to almost completely cut them out of my life, and I've lived in peace for seven years. I don't intend to have kids. I don't intend to get married and live together, even dating. So my expenses are with me and my four pets, two dogs and two cats. They live a life of luxury, honestly, because I have a job that pays well. I have a three-bedroom, three-bathroom house, the two suites I used for bedroom and office. The spare room is for my pets. The entire room is modified, several things on the wall for the cats, beds, toys, a door that leads to the backyard. I like to sleep completely alone and in peace, which has already proved ineffective when sleeping with all of them. My parents only visited my house once, and before my pets, the oldest is four years old. So really, at the time, there was an empty room. Last week, my parents called me saying they lost their house, financed and delayed a lot of installments, and asked if they could come stay in the spare room. I said that only the living room would be available. They could sleep on the floor, mattress, or sofa, very spacious and comfortable, as the free room became my pet's room. They started to get angry, saying that pets could sleep in the living room instead of them, and that it's extremely disrespectful to offer parents, even worse, elderly people, to sleep in the living room on the floor or sofa when the pets could do it, in addition to complaints about my lifestyle and the fact that I have a pet room. I got angry and said my house was not open to them. Since then, I've been being bombarded by their messages saying that they're in a hotel, spending what they shouldn't, and next week they'll have to go to a shelter because I uninvited them and preferred my pets over not leaving them homeless. Other relatives couldn't help and they didn't bother either because they know how much of a pain my parents are. I already blocked them, but would like an outside opinion. Am I the jerk? Extra. I don't help them financially, as I've been the target of emotional blackmail in the past because of it and would rather it not happen again. Not the jerk. I have a feeling that if you let them stay in the living room for a week, they'll still be there a year from now. We'll be reading a post about how you had to move out of your house and buy a new house for yourself just to get away from your parents. It's hard not to feel some pressure here, but it's your life. They did this to themselves, and they had to work hard to do it. Think about all the missed opportunities they had to prevent this from happening. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you give the room to your parents, or let your pets keep using it? Please let us know. I'd put up a tent for mom and dad in the backyard. My boss won't let us have last orders. I'm in the UK, in a popular tourist destination. Our restaurant is also a farm shop kind of thing, just off a busy road, so we can get really busy sometimes. Not too bad at night, though. We close at 8, 7 during the winter. We're not allowed to mop, sweep, or hoover while we have customers in. However, after 6 p.m., we usually only have five members of staff in, two in the kitchen, one in the shop, and two in the restaurant, including the bar. So basically, as soon as the bosses leave, we do everything we can get away with. Sometimes sweeping and mopping if there's only one or two tables in, as we do have sectioned off areas and we'll keep the main walkway clear for customers to leave. This woman came into our shop at about 7.50 p.m. on a Wednesday night. When she entered our shop, the person told her we will be closing in 10 minutes. I won't be long, was all she said. At this point, me and my coworker had no one in and we're doing our best to sweep and mop and finish the bar before 8. Can't do the till until after 8. I had the hoover out ready to go. 
Our shopkeeper then started rushing her to either buy something or leave, to which she announced she was planning on eating here, knowing we're not allowed to send people away before the door is locked. This woman saw us both counting money and hoovering with half the chairs in the room on the tables and still comes in telling us she's in a caravan outside and has been waiting for our place to quiet down. We'd been quiet all night. She meant she wanted the place and us to herself. When she finally ordered scampi, after complaining our specials weren't available anymore, she took 40 minutes to eat the thing, and then even wanted tea afterwards, which took her a further half an hour to finish. All this time we couldn't do anything, couldn't finish cleaning, couldn't do the till. We helped the kitchen finish as we all have to leave together, but the shopkeeper could leave. Finally at 9.10 she's done and ready to pay before telling us she's going to go look around the shop some more. I'm afraid not. The shop and restaurant both closed at 8 and we'll have to ask you to leave via the fire escape. But I want to look around the shop. Well, I'm afraid it's shut. It's open from 8 tomorrow morning. Didn't you say you were staying in a caravan outside? But I don't want to shop with other people. People. After paying, this woman continued to try getting through the barriers into our shop and we had to walk her outside into her caravan just so she would leave. Fortunately, between the four of us, we were out by half past nine, but this woman caused four members of our staff to stay an hour and a half and keeping the building open and lights and electricity on for $13.95, no tip. Yet, my boss still won't let us have last orders. Am I the jerk for not letting my in-laws move in with me? I, 24 female, met my husband who's 23 when we were 15 and 16 in high school. We found out I was pregnant shortly after we started dating and I gave birth to our son at 17. Since then, our relationship was on a fast track and we got married at 21 after finishing school. We bought a house last year and my in-laws have not been super supportive of our decisions. They made constant jokes about selling their house to move in with us and bringing my husband's two siblings, both adults, with them since they live with them full time. But it all changed when they tried to push us to buy a bigger and more expensive house than we wanted so that we had a room for when the family wanted to come visit and stay. My mother-in-law kept showing husband houses she liked and when he told her we were looking for something different, she told him we had to compromise for the family. They finally lost it on us when we told them we put an offer on a house more than seven hours away, which was in an area we planned to move to all along, we just never told them and they didn't handle that well telling me I'm taking their son and grandchild away from them. The offer went through and we moved in as soon as possible, but had to deal with in-laws constantly coming to visit uninvited. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law were showing up every weekend for months without calling in advance. Husband and I both tried to explain that we are constantly having to cancel weekend plans for their visits and canceling other friends and family visits because of them, but they don't care. Making my home their second home not listening to our rules and constantly undermining me in my own home. Finally, we told them if they didn't call and ask in advance, they would be turned away at the door and they stopped showing up. Two weeks ago, husband got a call from father-in-law saying that his job had laid him off and he would be short on expenses this month. That's when mother-in-law took the phone and suggested this be the perfect time for them to come move closer to us. They were already looking to sell their home and they could all come stay with us until father-in-law found a new job. We told them our home couldn't accommodate four more people, nor could we financially support them. Father-in-law insisted it wouldn't be for long, but he is very frugal and does not like to spend money unnecessarily, and I feel like this is just an excuse to cut back on living expenses for them. I also want my son to have room to grow and have room for a second kid someday in the next year or so. My husband is in the middle and understands why I don't want them moving in, but at the same time, he thinks we shouldn't turn our backs on his family. I'm torn because I think I have a solid argument for as why they shouldn't, but it is my husband's house too and I don't want to upset him. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If you let them move in, they will never leave and they will mooch off you and your husband and probably ruin your marriage. Your home can't accommodate yourselves and your kid, two more adults, two more kids with all of their belongings. Your husband needs to tell his parents that he's sorry they're facing difficulties, but that dad needs to apply for new jobs and both mom and dad need to work. He needs to tell them that they won't be able to move into your house for any length of time. If they want to live in your area, they should start applying for jobs and looking for rentals. He further needs to tell them that he would be happy to look over their finances to see if there's room for improvement, but the two of you can't afford to financially support them. He needs to be kind but firm. 
There's a good chance that mother-in-law and father-in-law plan to move in with you and your husband and retire, expecting you to pay their living expenses for the remainder of their lives. Given their insistence, allowing them to move in when they are relatively young and healthy would be a big mistake. Bought my Karen girlfriend a new iPhone. Sadly, it was the wrong color. It was my girlfriend's, 23, birthday, and I, 25 male, got her an iPhone 12 Pro, as she's been wanting one for a while, so I saved up and it was very expensive. When I surprised her with it, I was expecting her to be excited, but instead, she told me that she wanted a black one, not a white one. The thing is, she never told me she wanted black. She just always said she wanted the phone itself. When I told her I didn't know, she told me that I ruined her birthday and just left. I was honestly in shock and disbelief that she was so upset about a phone color. I didn't know what to do with the phone and planned on taking it back. But then I remembered that my sister, who's 19, just had a baby and unfortunately had to drop out of college to find a job. I decided that I was going to give the phone to her since the phone she had was not working well anymore. I told her that I would give the phone to her, but I still had to check if my girlfriend changed her mind. So I texted her saying, this is your last chance to change your mind about the phone because I plan on giving it to my sister. And she just texted me back, I don't care. I asked her one last time and again she said, I told you I don't care. So that was that. A few hours later, I was in bed when my girlfriend came in and asked me where was her phone and I told her, I thought you didn't want it. I'm sorry, but it's too late now. I already gave it to my sister. She got angry and started shouting at me, saying that she thought I was joking and that it was her phone, so I had no right to give it away and started stomping her feet, saying she wanted her phone back right now. I lost my cool and told her, you are an adult behaving like a kid who didn't get their way. I asked you twice if you wanted the phone and you said no. Now, please leave me alone and stop behaving like a toddler. She stomped her way out of the room and texted me saying that I was a jerk and now all of her friends are ganging up on me. So now I'm wondering, am I the jerk? Huge shout out to FBI SWAT team who left us a new review on Apple Podcasts. You're alive. Glad to know that you are still alive. We sure are. Thank you so much for leaving us a review on the Mr. Redder podcast on Apple Podcasts. Come subscribe to the Mr. Redder podcast on your favorite podcast app. And if you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, we'll read it in an upcoming video. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.